Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very grateful that I have the opportunity to continue my research at this wonderful business school with these wonderful and inspiring colleagues. And I hope very much uh, that uh, we together bring uh, things forward, which I uh, am interested in particular in the area of governance of different fields in governance of companies, of monasteries, and uh, of universities and research institutions as well. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today uh, about, a speak of, about a piece of research I have conducted together with uh, Bruno Frey. Many of the ideas I would like to uh, discuss with you today are developed uh, together. For those who have read the newspaper this morning, uh, my talk is related to two topical issues relevant for universities. Maybe you have read that Daniel Schechtman, Daniel Schechtman is a new Nobel Prize winner in chemistry. His research some years ago was heavily criticized by his colleagues, including Linus Paulik, the Nobel, Nobel Prize winner of 1954. In the beginning, his work was rejected by peer review journals. He was thrown out of his uh, research group at the university, at the Technical University of Haifa, because he was accused of disgracing his group with his research. Why do I mention this? This stands for the fact that peers and peer reviews as well make huge mistakes in evaluating uh, and assessing the quality and originality of research. Peer review stands for the quality management in the Republic of science. A second uh, issue in the newspapers today might have caught your interest, that the New Time Higher Education World University Ranking 2011-2012 was released, by the way, in a way that resembles uh, uh, yeah, to the publishing of hit parade uh, and beauty contests, but that's another thing. Um, the interesting thing you have, may have noticed as, is that Harvard is no longer number one, but has to share rank number two and three together with the Stanford University. And the good uh, news is Oxford has shifted from rank six to rank four. But it is important to know that the editor of the Times Higher Education ranking, Phil Bay, last year, admitted big mistakes during the last six years in producing this ranking. He wrote in an internal uh, journal, the rankings of the world's top universities that my magazine has been publishing for the past six years, which have attracted enormous global attention, has serious weaknesses. He de describes the method uh, the, this ranking applies as embarrassing, and he promised to improve the methods. This issue also, on the other hand, shows that attempts to give the public an insight what is good research um, and uh, about the quality of universities is a very problematic one. If even the editor of one of these uh, rankings admits that he has delivered work that is uh, based on embarrassing criteria, there something must be wrong and we don't know yet whether the promise is fulfilled that the ranking which has been delivered today is better than the rankings of the uh, last years. So, whom should we trust? when it comes to evaluate academic quality. 
that's the question I, I want uh, to ask and to, to want to deal with. So the plan of what I'm doing is, firstly, um, would outline the differences between these two concepts of new public management on the one hand and Republic of Science consisting of peers on the other hand. And the second step, I will explain why the quality of both institutions is highly questionable and step Three means that I would like to discuss some suggestions how to improve uh, the system. In particular, um, uh, suggestions informed on the one hand by management control theory, by psychological economics, and by research on partially random selection. And that would be the most uh, provocative uh, suggestion uh, I would like to present. Let me start with the concept of new public management. As you probably know, the concept of pr uh, new public management has the aim of creating an enterprise university by output monitoring, by strong leadership, by more market into the research institutions and the one of the most important overall goals of new public management is to raise accountability of, instit of research institutions um, and of universities to the public. That's in a nutshell the concept of new public management. This concept is very much in contradiction on the first glance, to the concept of Republic of Science. Here you have two uh, citations of Polanyi. Polanyi is a sociologist of science, a very famous uh, one, who tells us that the authority of scientific opinion is, uh, not, is, is established between scientists, not above it. So it means that scholarship and academic work should be an autonomous one and it should be evaluated only by peers. That's the Republic uh, of Science. And the reason why the Republic of Science in the sense of Polanyi has to be independent and autonomous is that we have a strong market failure in the scientific area, um, which means research is characterized by fundamental uncertainty is characterized, for example, by uh, a lot amount of so-called serendipity effect. Serendipity effect means you find out something you haven't asked for. And the most important serendipity e effect everybody knows is the discovery of uh, America. Everybody knows Columbus looked for India and then he discovered uh, America. Porcelain, radioactivity, and penicillin, just uh, to uh, uh, name one of these serendipity effects. So it doesn't make sense uh, in a lot of research to tell people you should find out this or that. We have to take into account this huge uncertainty and these serendipity effect. This means, means that evaluation by output or markets has to be substituted by the, uh, by the evaluation of peers in contrast uh, to the public, which is the aim of new public management in the Republic of Science, the accountability to the Republic of Science is what counts, not to the public. So. It could be the case that uh, this contradiction could be solved. If we take or if we accept that the peer review system, which is the founding stone of academic quality management, creates what we can uh, characterize as a quasi-market, and the quasi-market in the academic world is created by the so-called priority rule, which means he or she who has invented the things first is the best one, and rankings, for example, is exactly the currency uh, which, uh, which is according to that priority rule, and rankings tell the public who don't understand nothing about the content of the research who is the first, who is the best. 
And so some people believe that the ranking system, in particular the ranking system and the output man uh, management uh, uh, and measurement is a perfect combination between new public management on the one side and the Republic of Science on the other side. This would be true only if the founding stone of academic quality management is in order and is reliable. So let's look into more details. What about the quality of peer review system on, on the first side and on the second hand, the quality of rankings. Let's look into the quality of peer, the peer review system. There is a lot of literature, empirical literature, about the quality of uh, the peer review system. What we know today is that the inter-rater reliability is very, very low. The uh, re reliability between two reviewers is 0 0.1, 0 0.1 to 0 0.3 at the maximum. There was a very famous uh, natural field experiment by, conducted by Peter and Gigi some years ago. Um, they took 12 articles in a famous psychological uh, um, uh, journals. They made new titles, new abstract, and they submitted it again. Out of these 12 articles, after uh, 18 uh, and uh, after some months, uh, they, they uh, um, gave them to the, to the journal uh, peer review system. Only three were recognized as plagiarism. Eight of the remaining nine articles were rejected. In clinical neuro neuroscience, uh, a correlation between, between peer, reviews, peer reviews was found close to random selection. It's very important to notice also that uh, the reliability is better with articles rejected and it's much lower with articles uh, uh, accepted. That's also an important information. So much about inter-rater reliability. Prognostic. Um, quality is also very, very low. The estimation of articles uh, correlates on average with 0 0.3 with citations. And there are many dry holes, which means articles published in eight journals which are never cited. Low consistency over time. That's the case I, I reported about uh, this Nobel Prize winner in chemistry, but we have other famous uh, 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 um, examples for that, which means that famous articles were rejected in the beginning and then the authors won the Nobel Prize. Uh, some uh, uh, examples you know probably is Arrow, uh, Mandelbrot, another example, and in, in the business world, Barney is not a Nobel Prize winner, but a very important scholar in the strategic management field. His famous article was rejected several, for seven times, and then he published it in a special issue he edited. Uh, confirmation bias, that means that reviewers find in 72% of unorthodox papers methodological problems, in mainstream papers, only 25%. So we can see, and, and there are some rational and selfish uh, reviewers, we can imagine that that exists. Which means the quality of peer review, we shouldn't trust too much in, in this quality. What about the quality of rankings? Rankings have a lot of advantages. I don't have to go through it. It's uh, self-evident. I only want, uh, would like to hint to, to the last point that uh, one of the most important advantages, advantages 
of uh, rankings is that they further the accountability to the public because everybody can count from 1 to 100 and has the impression of now knowing what is a good kind of research and what is bad kind of research. So that are the advantages. But what are the problems of peer-based rankings? By the way, I'm only talking about academic rankings. At the moment, I don't talk about business school rankings, which include, for example, the income of, uh, of uh, uh, the students later on. I don't, don't, do not con consider at the moment these kind of rankings. But uh, the academic part of these rankings and the problems is very similar to what I'm saying about the academic rankings. There are four kinds of uh, problems. Let me go uh, through these kind of problems uh, very quickly. First, there are technical problems, which means these are problems which in principle could be solved. And some of the problems are loss of citation, 77 to 30%. In particular, if you have a very common name like Smith, or if you have a very uncommon name, a Chinese name, for example, or an Indian a name, which people can't spell exactly, then the chance that your citation will be lost is very, very high, or the risk, I should say. <laughs> uh, second, uh, a huge errors in attributing publication and citation to the source. Uh, oh, there's a Shanghai University ranking according to the empirical literature in the European list. Ten positions are uh, a, a problem and in the world list even more. And we know that small changes in classifications can have huge effects in rankings. The New World uh, uh, Times Higher Education ranking, the differences we have that Harvard is no longer number one may be due, may be due to the fact, I don't have uh, the opportunity to analyze the ranking uh, today, that there are some criteria, some criteria have changed in, in, in the whole system. So the next uh, kind of problems are methodological problems. First of all, selection problems, which means everybody knows only journal articles are counted, no books. And there are a lot of uh, uh, problems we should be uh, related to uh, very, yeah, uh, it should be, uh, there should be written books about that. Small regional fields are underrepresented and what what we have discussed this morning, that normally you don't have the opportunity to publish an interdisciplinary work uh, in a disciplinary journal, so interdisciplinarity is not furthered by these kind of uh, rankings. <coughs> citation problems. You should never compare citations, for example, in operations research with uh, citation in the strategy area because uh, uh, they are very different. Citations can be rejecting as well, and that's not a signal of, of quality. And uh, the last point is an interesting one. According to analysis of um, uh, mistakes that are transferred by, by citing people, uh, it came out uh, estimation that 70 to 90 percent of all citations are based on papers which are not read which means there is a huge Matthew effect, which means if, wem hat dem wird gegeben, how to translate that in English? Uh, Richard Richard. Richard Richard, thank you. So, and, and the last point are impact factors. You never should evaluate a piece of pay, uh, 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 an article on the basis of the, of the impact uh, uh, the journal has, because a lot of Papers published in high-ranked journals are dry holes and the other way around. So it's a huge mistake to, to think that an A journal paper is a really good uh, and an important contribution to research. But still, these are problems which could be solved in principle, so it is very costly. What is much more a, a problem, which can I see no possibility to solve that really, are the unintended side effects of rankings. And I made a difference between um, 
uh, three kinds of unintended side effects, the uh, lack of heterogeneity and the so-called reactivity problem. Lack of heterogeneity means, and that's quite simple, that rankings are a one-dimensional thing. And normally, scientific work is characterized by disputes. Disputes, that's at the height of uh, scientific works, um, because scholarly work is characterized by great uncertainty and ambiguity and controversial disputes are at the height of scientific work and rankings do quite the contrary. They put all kind of research in a one-dimensional order. So that doesn't fit to the spirit of, um, of uh, research. But these scholarly endeavors and these scholarly disputes are not easy to understand by the, pub by the public. That's a, that's a disadvantage. So the reactivity, that's another very important um, issue. Normally, scholars are intelligent people. So they react on the criteria with which they are measured. That's quite clear. But uh, I always wondered why economists, economists normally think of unintended side effect firstly, but obviously with rankings, uh, they forgot what they normally um, uh, think about. So they should think about reactivity with a publication issue as well. So one of the most important thing is what uh, economists call multiple tasking or goal displacement, which means that you are maximizing that characteristics which are measured and you are not looking at the char characteristics which are not measured or easy to measure. That means you maximize the amount of publication, for example, by the slicing strategy. You slice your ideas in four to five um, uh, papers. Counter strategies to beat the system consist, for example, what Bruno has called academic prostitution, and we have some evidence. Bedean has uh, done that empirical work in, uh, in the management area that up to 25% of authors change their papers according to what the reviewers say, so though they know that this is a mistake. 25 to 30%, that's academic prostitution. Um, and also intrinsic motivation of scholars might be crowded out and we knew from, we know from a lot of empirical work by Amabile and by other uh, scholars that intrinsic motivation is the most important thing for really um, creative scholarly work. And that might, uh, and, and the consequence might be that the taste for science, which is an intrinsic motivation to do good research, is changed into a taste for publication. Unintended side effects uh, are also at the institutional level, first of all, uh, the lock-in effect, which means if you are part of the system, it's, it's really hard to oppose against, against ranking. Mark Taylor is not able to tell the people, I, I, don't, I don't mind the rankings of, of the Warwick Business School. He isn't able to do so, so he is locked in in uh, the system. And also we have empirical research in particular from Great Britain that these rankings lead to a homogenization in research, in particular in, eco in economics and to short-time projects. So what are the suggestions? I have talked about the peer review system is not working. Rankings have a lot of problems. So what should we do if you take into account uh, these uh, uh, criticism? I have four kinds of improvements which I would like um, to discuss with you. The first is what a lot of people think about, uh, that is a so-called uh, informed peer review. 
Informed peer review means that you can use rankings, but you can use it only in an, in an informed way. That means you know about the criteria, you know about the weight that is given to the different criteria, and you can take that into account by evaluating your, um, your kind of research you are interested in. And uh, I think that's a good advice, but the disadvantage is the accountability to the public is low because this is again peer review work and it's, it's not about count, counting from one um, to ten. Also that includes that you use many different rankings uh, so that you can evaluate which ranking is fitting for my um, um, uh, case and which not. So that's quite common that informed uh, peer, re peer review. Uh, the second, um, so these are the advantages and disadvantages of uh, informed peer review. Uh, the problems of qualitative peer reviews are mitigated, uh, but they are not eliminated. It's quite clear it's a uh, um, peer review. And uh, the public is not uh, uh, informed in, in an easy to comprehend uh, way. The second suggestion is a more provoking one, which means that we should no longer emphasize too much on output control, and rankings are output controls, but we should <coughs> emphasize more on input control. And that idea I got from the management control theory. In management control theory, there's a simple uh, differentiation between three kinds of problem, output control, which normally uh, you, could, you could undertake that kind of control with simple tasks or on the assembly line, for example. Even on the assembly line, it's sometimes problematic, but uh, in principle it works. Process control, which means you monitoring what people are doing. You don't monitor the output, but you monitor what they, the processes. And uh, that is very... Uh, Adapt, uh, you can use that if the processes are predefined, which is sometimes the case uh, in, in the scholarly work named state of the art. But sometimes if it comes to a new paradigm in the sense of Kuhn, then process control is problematic. So if output control doesn't work, and if process control doesn't work, <coughs> because, for example, of paradigm shift, uh, shifts and the chemis Nobel Prize for, of Chemistry was just about such a paradigm shift in the sense of uh, Kuhn, then both kind of controls don't work. And then a third kind of control is recommended uh, with, a, uh, with control uh, literature. That means input control for novel and ambiguous task, which means rigorous selection and socialization of scholars instead of permanent output monitoring and, uh, in brackets, process monitoring. Which means the selection, the selection process of new colleagues in your school, in your business school at the university as a whole, is the most important thing. And if you do not correct select people, then it's a myth that you could compensate that by output control because then all these unintended side effects I discussed would take place and people would put their energy into that uh, multiple tasking and, and, and to that uh, uh, um, things I've, uh, I've talked about instead of improving the quality because normally it's easier uh, to do uh, uh, these multiple tasking than really to improve your creativity or things like that. So rigorous selection is the most important thing for the scholarly work. And there are some important examples that this input control works. Harvard, the Harvard principle, which is written there. Then uh, two other um, uh, um, examples, Queensland University. Queensland University do that kind of input control and in contrast to the University of Western Australia and the success of Queensland University measured by citations. I must confess at the end I also looking at citation. Um, um, 
is, is much higher. And in the United States, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute gives uh, the scholars a lot of autonomy in contrast to the National Institute of Health. And again, the output in the long run is much better in the Howard Hughes Medical Institute than in the other one. Of course, there are advantages and disadvantages. Uh, the most important advantage is that it allows autonomy and unorthodox research after that, uh, after you have got that entrance ticket, uh, uh, because you are not subject to all that kind of output controls in a, in a regular way. It includes informed peer review, which means it is an overall kind of evaluation. It includes heterogeneity. Yeah, uh, and it does not, um, does not destroy intrinsical, intrins intrinsic motivation. Of course, there are also disadvantages, and the most uh, important disadvantage is that the success is measurable only after a long time, and the public is not really able to comprehend what is done in the research area. So, let me come to the to other suggestions. The third uh, suggestion is to rely more on award, and that's uh, specifically done this kind of research by Bruno Frey and Susanne Neckermann. They have done a lot of empirical work, not in the research area, but in the, in the company area, where they found out that awards really motivate people. So awards are an extrinsic uh, remuneration, quite clear, but because they are an overall evaluation, they cannot be easily manipulated as rankings and as uh, others, uh, other uh, clear-cut criteria. They do not destroy um, intrinsic uh, motivation uh, and it avoids that goal displacement. Of course, there are also disadvantages we do not know uh, after five years whether this works really or not. So, let me come to my last and most provocative suggestion, or our suggestion. Um, uh, we developed this uh, together, Bruno Frey and me. And we were inspired by the fact that um, allotment or demarchy, or sometimes it's called sortition, which is, means partially random selection after a minimum con uh, control for minimum standards. Demarchy has a long and famous history. Demarchy was applied in classical Athens. It was applied in Venice and um, um, Genova. Uh, the system of dodges, the dojen, they were, that's a mixture of selection and of, of election and random selection. And they were quite successful. Also, some North Italian cities had this system of demarchy. Um, and we, we uh, reflected whether this system could be applied to research governance as, um, as well. There are some famous disadvantages, and one must confess that is a disadvantage. It does not discriminate between good or bad papers or between good or bad people in the case um, of uh, the Dodgers, for example. But, as it's written here, as I told you in the beginning, in the peer review system, so the selection of papers very often, in particular in that medical area I mentioned, is close to randomness too. So this problem, yeah, we should take that into account. Secondly, that's quite clear. If there is a random system, the in incentive or the motivation to try to publish again and again and again is higher. But if you use, um, uh, that's part of the advantage on the, on the next slide, um, the uh, selection process itself, the peer review uh, process in itself, becomes 
um, easier because you only have to select for a, for a minimal um, um, quality and that's much easier than the, the peer review system we have today. So, what are the advantages? And these advantages are as well in the, in the demarchy system, in the political demarchy system, as in uh, the peer review system. The first and most important is that referees' bias are downplayed. They still exist because you have to define minimum criteria uh, when a paper is rejected. That's quite clear, but they are downplayed. The system works, can work in a different way. That's, uh, that's a false point. The degree of randomness can be varied. For example, there is a, a suggestion that if um, the reviewers agree about acceptance, then the paper is accepted. If they agree about rejection, then it's rejection, uh, rejected, and only people in mid of these both criteria, they are uh, subdued to a, to a random selection. You could do that. You also could uh, choose a, a, a much uh, radical solution, which means that only these papers are rejected where all reviewers uh, um, are agree to reject it, and all else are published. That's a more radical um, uh, solution. So one can vary in, uh, in different areas for different principles applied in these, with this random selection, and uh, uh, we haven't uh, developed suggestion in which area one should uh, apply which principle. So uh, the plus one principle, that would be the principle uh, that uh, the paper has to be um, um, uh, reviewed whether the technical and methodological um, criteria are fulfilled and then you can put it on the plus uh, system but you have to pay for it it's not uh, it's not cheap 2000 euros per paper so and and again the disadvantage of that plus uh, system is as i mentioned in the beginning uh, mainstream articles are much more accepted in technical dimensions than radical uh, papers. The, the rejection uh, because of uh, methodological reasons is much higher with unorthodox papers than with uh, mainstream papers. So that's a problem of the plus one principle. So this is uh, how the system works. The referee biases are down downplayed. They still exist, of course, but they are downplayed. Chronism is avoided, uh, avoided, and that's the most important advantage of all kind of uh, these demarchy principle that uh, influence costs, they are avoided. If a random principle works, then it doesn't uh, make sense to this kind of work. And it's a search machine for new ideas, uh, and uh, unorthodox papers have a better uh, chance. And Another advantage of this system is success is easy to measure by the public, let me say after one or two years, whether these papers are cited or not. By the way, the plus one has a very high impact, four point something, uh, which is quite, uh, quite nice uh, for such a paper. So there are, of course, like all suggestions, have um, advantages and disadvantages disadvantages, so let me come to the conclusion that both systems, both ideas, new public management on the one hand and the public of uh, science can complement each other if you play down the role of rankings and of peer reviews because both have a lot of problems by, for example, input controls by awards and the most radical solution would be allotments. Thank you. <laughs>